Hi guys, Emma here, and in this video I'm going to be watching David Lynch's Lost Highway. It's a 1997 movie, it's certificate 18, so it does contain like adult stuff. It's going to be an edited video of me just discussing what I think and feel, um, but I'm going to play it in the background. The movie stars Bill Pullman, Patricia Arquette, Balthazar Getty, who was in Twin Peaks recently, um, Robert Loggia. So I've actually seen this movie quite a lot of times. Um, it is one of my favourite movies, I would say. I saw it not long after it was released, and then I saw it at the cinema a few years later um, on the big screen that is not sounding good. Yeah, I saw it on the big screen, and I really enjoyed it when I saw it on the big screen because the cinematography of it, I guess, is really stunning and it really popped out when it was on this big screen and the sound as well was, was really nice. It's got an amazing soundtrack, Lost Highway, um, check that out. A hardcore soundtrack, I think, um, but I've, I listen to it all the time and it features the music of Angelo Badalamenti as well as artists like um, David Bowie, Nine Inch Nails, Marilyn Manson, Lou Reed. I'm here. Yeah, it's like a super cool soundtrack as if as if they tried to assemble like the coolest and darkest artists out there sort of who have this vibe of being not quite consistent with the norm I guess but it's a very enjoyable soundtrack to listen to so as far as I can remember it doesn't feature one song which is really prominent in the soundtrack and in the movie um, and that is oh, I can't remember what it's called now it's in the floating <laughs> song to the siren yeah it doesn't feature that which is a shame. So I'm playing the movie now, but I'm gonna to have to mute it because of not being able to play the soundtrack for copyright reasons on YouTube. So the intro and the outro as well as in this movie is very memorable. It's a car or a camera or a person or something traveling down a road. It's like in the center of the road. It feels more like an entity rather than the car that's driving down there, but what does the road represent? I mean, the road could, rep could represent a lot of things. It could represent a journey into somewhere. It could uh, a journey of the mind. It could represent a journey of the soul or the spirit. It could represent an actual physical journey. You know, it's a, it's a motif or an image that David Lynch enjoys using, that image of a road in darkness. And there is a sense that you never really know where you're going. And that something strange and dark could be the destination. Okay, so we open with this shot of this guy smoking and to me he looks troubled. You can tell straight away that something is not quite right. It's almost as if he's trying to control some kind of nervosa thing. You know, he looks like he's slightly shaking when he takes a drag on the cigarette. He hears his intercom buzz and when he answers it, there's a voice saying Dick Laurent is dead. But the message certainly seems to have affected this guy. We follow this guy around his apartment and there's lots of dark spaces and close spaces as well. He appears to be paranoid about being watched because he's looking out the windows a lot. It's almost as if his home is a cage to him. Okay, so there is a fade out and then after that we don't know if this is immediately afterwards but the guy, he seems a bit more chipper and he looks a lot healthier. Um, Patricia Arquette walks in, she's very sultry. There is obviously some kind of communication problem with these two because read. it looks like he doesn't believe what she says read when she says <laughs> she's gonna stay home and read. Okay, so their relationship is clearly troubled and the fact that they are married but having this strange conversation where nothing is really flowing right the way that they're speaking to each other. It's just definitely a, a weird vibe between the two of them. And she looks as if she's made up to do something else other than read. So we see the main character playing his saxophone and clearly that is his passion in life. He is completely lost when he's on the stage. We see him calling and he's obviously calling home the fact that he feels he needs to ring, you know, the look on his face, he completely looks like paranoid and obsessed with knowing what his wife is doing. So we see another Lynchian manoeuvre and that is of the red curtains. And it seems like Fred is dreaming, he is imagining what happened at the 
place where he was playing saxophone and he sees something that he didn't see before or we didn't see before he remembers something and something that troubles him okay so Fred and Renee get into bed so Lynch pays a lot of attention to this sex scene and it is very important sex scene I think it's you know not <laughs> not one that is just thrown in there for the for the titillation of it it's <laughs> we see Renee basically she is humiliating her husband when she makes love to him here because she's not really making love she is just satisfying him she's allowing himself to satisfy himself and when she pats him on the back she's like saying there you go it was more meaningful for you than it was for me and it is a disturbing moment to see Fred in that position it's embarrassing for him immediately after the sex scene we hear Fred talking about a dream he had and it's a very disturbing dream. In the dream, Fred looks really dark and as if he has assumed a different persona. He looks almost like a burglar in his own house. He is dressed in black and when he goes into the house, there's this strange smoke. The way the camera floats through the house, it feels very oppressive. There's a real heaviness about it. And Fred appears to strangle Renee, but then he wakes up and he sees his wife but she has a different face she has this weird kind of white face of a monster <laughs> the cgi on this is not brilliant i don't think so every time i see that it's a bit odd it looks a bit odd okay so the tension around these tapes that are being left at the house grows and grows because they receive another package and we learn more about the security system that it kept going off and it just sounds scarier and scarier that these people are being subject to something like they have some kind of stalker who is watching them and monitoring their every move okay so now we see Fred and Renee at this party and Renee asks Fred to get her a drink even that small action seems to upset him as if he doesn't like being used as her mule as if he just feels like he isn't being treated with much respect or he doesn't hold any worth for her and the way he's smoking he seems to be putting all his energy into the action of smoking as if that's a release for him okay so now we get to this scene which i think is one of the creepiest scenes in any movie i've ever seen where fred meets this guy at the party and he has the same face that he saw on his wife in his dream and the guy says that he is in Fred's house and he has this sickening grin on his face the whole time he's speaking to Fred as though he is all-knowing but he definitely seems to be getting some kind of sick kicks out of it and out of Fred's confusion so Fred rings his house and that is the creepiest thing when the voice answers. When Fred asks how the man got inside his house the man says it is not his custom to go where he has not been asked and this implies that he is some kind of supernatural being or entity, some kind of force. There is definitely some undercurrent here of something that we are not getting, um, something that is playing out in Fred's world that we are just not party to at this stage in the movie. And But that is evident from the performance and from his answers and the way he interacts with people. And On the way home, Fred questions Renee about her relationship with a guy at the party and Again, he seems very paranoid about what she's doing and who she's doing it with and he doesn't like it. You can tell that he doesn't like it. Her answers are not satisfactory. It's almost like she doesn't care enough to even formulate a good lie. So we get to this very dark and moody scene where Fred is walking through his house and we see shadows walking through. We see him emerging from a very black and bleak corridor. We have a blank screen for a very long time and then that pulls out and we don't quite know where we are it's very disconcerting that we have empty shots of just rooms with nothing in them again it feels very oppressive and it's a good way to um, build tension around this scene so Fred plays this cassette tape and it ultimately reveals Renee her, um, dead or covered in blood and, and it looks as if Fred has killed her and you know there's this moment where he is shocked and he, he he laughs he actually laughs because he can't believe what he's seeing it's almost as if he's watching a different person and he can't believe what has happened to Renee so he 
screams out her name and there's this strange white flashing it's almost like electrical shocks shock waves in your own mind and the next thing we know he's getting punched by this cop so it's funny that the prison world he is taken to is actually not much different to how his home life was um, very bleak and empty spaces he looks troubled still as if he can't quite deal with his own thoughts and then this eventually manifests as a physical condition that he is he seems to be sick it depends on your interpretation of the movie but obviously if you are if you have mental health problems they can often manifest as physical problems so i don't know if that's a reference to that or whether this plays into something else in your interpretation of the story when fred is in the prison we see various scenes which seem kind of abstract and you don't know if they're actually meant to be taken as a story to be interpreted as one story or or whether they are just evoking a feeling for the viewer or an idea fred appears to be self-harming we see an image of a young man we don't know what's going on with him we have no idea everything it seems jumbled as if we are witnessing a moment of crisis in the life of one person or maybe more than one person so the next thing we know uh, Fred has been <laughs> replaced by this much younger man who kind of looks like Fred but not exactly and he seems to share the same physical attributes as Fred but his name is Pete and the cops and prison wardens are able to find out who he is and they are able to um, identify him as being a real person who exists uh, the next we see of Pete, he is relaxing, although it doesn't look quite like relaxation in the typical sense. He appears to almost be recovering, I would say, from, from his experiences. Okay, so we have this appearance by Richard Pryor. I believe it was his last appearance in a movie. I think it's very interesting that he was um, cast in this role because it feels very realistic that he would have a condition like this um, This is you know something that is not always portrayed in Hollywood the fact that people have real-life illnesses that affect their daily lives Okay, so we see Pete at the garage and he appears to have settled in to whatever situation has occurred and he no longer has that like shocked look after just coming out of the prison. I think Robert Loggia plays a brilliant part in this movie. He's very memorable as Mr. Eddie um, and he has some great moments. One that's coming up right now. Yeah, when he's beating the crap out of this guy, <laughs> it is actually very terrifying. He looks so into it as, you know, as far as playing a bad guy goes, this is one of the most brutal scenes I think I can remember seeing in any movie and that short fuse you know from going from Mr. Nice Guy to this brutal attacker it's so terrifying to see that so we see Pete examining his own reflection in the mirror and he almost looks like he can't quite believe that he is healed is he thinking about himself in a physical sense or is it a mental healing that he has gone through Okay, so Jack Nance is also in this movie. I'm not sure if it was his last performance as well before he passed away. Okay, so Alice arrives at the garage and clearly Pete sees her and has an instant attraction to her and why wouldn't he? She looks like this kind of Marilyn Monroe-esque figure. Um, not quite Marilyn Monroe, but she's more like sort of um, another 1950s starlet who was a little bit more racy than Marilyn. Extremely bleached hair and pretty face, big lips silky clothes that look like they're barely hanging on there okay as far as patricia arquette her acting in this she seems to act as the same character i mean alice and renee seem like the same person to me and i don't know if that's intentional whether she's supposed to be the same person it depends on your interpretation i guess arquette certainly plays it like they're the same person she has the same voice she has the same demeanor she has the same sensuality and things quickly escalate between Pete and Alice. Okay, so we have this strange conversation with Pete and his parents and there is the sense that there is something that is not being 
spoken out loud that they know something um, terrible about Pete. Ultimately, the parents appear to be protecting Pete from something terrible. And we have this flashback of Pete. He's remembering something. We see flashing lights that are very similar to the flashing lights that we saw with Fred early on in the movie. So Alice, I think in Pete's life, she starts to become more and more of a temperist. And she really seems to have a lot of control over this young lad, as if she can just, you know, show a bit of flesh and Pete's like following around like a lost puppy. I think he would do anything that she asked him to. I think there's a scene where Alice is, she has a gun pointed to her head and it's almost as if like femininity and female sexuality is being held to ransom by the entire male community because there's just like a room full of people watching her and she is made to undress and she looks terrified. Does the gun double as a phallic symbol here because it is constantly in the scene and she um, she eventually has to own her own fear, use her sexiness as a weapon um, instead of letting them control her. She tries to turn it around and say, well, this is my body, I'm in charge of it, and it's my power sort of thing. Okay, so we have this very strange scene where Pete bloodied goes down this corridor. Um, again, we see this very strong electricity flashing on and off, flashing on and off, as if something is happening, as if this is an energy source that is transformative of something. So we see Pete and Renee making love outside um, Renee enters this building in the desert and when she does, Pete stands up and it is Fred. He has turned into Fred. The strange white-faced figure appears in the car and, and on the balcony of the building, Fred follows the man into the building and the man confronts him. Alice is no longer there. Pete, Fred asks where Alice is and the man tells him that her name wasn't Alice, it was Renee, and if she said something else, she was lying. And he is very angry about this. He is, he is very confrontational with Fred. Then he demands to know what Fred's name is. And the very question, I think, it brings up a lot about identity and who we think we are, who we feel we are, who we are in our minds we are in our hearts, the age we feel inside, and much more. And when this man turns the camera on Fred, it's almost as if he is forcing him to confront these ideas and to confront himself. He's forcing him to become part of the, the art forever and to be pinned down onto this form where he is, his true self is shown and it can't be erased, it can't be rewritten. It's almost like a terrible confession he is trying to force Fred to make. Okay, so we see Fred catch Rene and Mr. Eddie together. When we see Fred attack Mr. Eddie, it seems like someone else puts the knife into his hand. There are many ways to interpret that, I think. Is, is this Fred imagining that his feelings, his, his anger, his choice was something else, like it had assumed its own character because it was so powerful, all this rage and hate and anger that he felt towards Renee and towards Mr. Eddie. It had actually manifested as an entity, a force, an evil. Okay, so ultimately we see Fred back on the road. He is being pursued by police. There is no way out for Fred here. He knows that, uh, he feels trapped. We see this awful image of him distorted and screaming and the light flashes again and he looks as if he is in unutterable pain. This is the end for him. Okay, so the, one of the most common interpretations of the movie, should it have to be interpreted, is that Fred killed his wife and when he was imprisoned, he imagined himself as a younger man, imagined all these scenarios with Pete. Um, it, his relationship with Rene played out as like that one 
of Pete and Alice, like the relationship of Pete and Alice, and identities were shifted slightly in his dream. Um, either this was a death dream or it could have been an actual dream that he manifested um, as a like a daydream, but he imagines himself the killer part of himself as another being, as an evil entity, because it is so difficult for him to accept that that's who, is, who he has become. But ultimately, this interpretation involves the fact that Fred has been sentenced to death, um, and the end scene is one where we see him being put in the electric chair and killed basically um, and I think that that's a very valid interpretation and that's how I see it definitely um, but I think that there are probably many ways to look at the movie I don't even know if it really has to be interpreted to be enjoyed it feels almost like a, just a very atmospheric piece I think and it makes you feel tense and nervous throughout um, and you can understand what these characters are going through without knowing actually what they're going through or why. I like the feeling that there, this is a dream or a nightmare all the way through, that nothing is quite as it seems and we don't exactly know what's going on but we can feel it, we can... we are given enough abstract images to put the pieces together and to formulate our own dream worlds that are connected with this art um, if anything about the movie disappoints me, it's Patricia Arquette's role because, I don't know, I, I mean, I think it's the characters of Alice and Renee combined. To me, they're very one-dimensional. She doesn't come across as a real character in the same way that some of the other characters do. She, I mean, maybe that's the point, but she's very sexualized and that is basically the most important thing about her character, that she represents this figure who is irresistible to men and whose physical image is one that can set forth a chain of events that are so meaningful. <laughs> even in even in that early section with Fred and Renee, there was a sense that Fred was really enamored by Renee's appearance and her sexuality, her sexiness, her, her flesh. Her physical form, the fact that she was so beautiful and was an object who could provide sexual gratification, basically. And that came across more than the fact that Fred was in love with her because of her mind and because she was this very interesting person to talk to or have a good laugh with. <laughs> None of that came through and I think that that's probably the point. When we get to Pete's world, I feel like the things that appear in Pete's world are like panaceas, if that's what you're, if that's how I'm saying it right, but they are like um, things that would be calming to someone who would be in a position if they were on death row or if they were thinking about their past they might consider things like thinking about their parents, thinking about their girlfriends, thinking about being in a safe environment with their friends. His parents are very protective and they have real feelings towards him um, and wanting to wanting him to have a good life and Pete himself is cast as almost as this innocent who is almost just caught up in events and is led astray by this woman who who was almost like a devil woman you know ultimately I feel disturbed when I watch Lost Highway I feel disturbed for Fred most of all I think it's a good performance by Bill Pullman uh, he, he really makes me feel something for his character even if even if he is a killer and I just think it's a very clever movie. It is one of my favorite movies by Lynch and I would definitely recommend trying to see this at the, the cinema if you can because it's a whole different experience. I think this particular movie is filled with images that are menacing and which are foreboding and that really plays out on the big screen. It feels much more terrifying and oppressive and, you know, the shadows are bigger, <laughs> the, the, the darkness is bigger. So and it also feels like a modern kind of terror, even though um, the VHS tapes and everything feel a little dated now and so does the soundtrack feel a little dated. It definitely feels like a movie that was made in the 90s, um, but I still think that the message of the movie the core story feels identifiable now. 
and I just think visually it's very impressive and the way it's edited feels very impressive as well. It never loses that sense of feeling like a dream from the beginning to the end. And many of the scenes I think play on the, the subconscious mind and tap into those fears that we all have about ourselves, about our relationship with people and the way we view others and the way we view ourselves and how we feel as sexually motivated beings. Uh, <laughs> I, I just think it's a very clever intuitive movie and one that deserves to be seen. So anyway that's it for today. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, if you have any thoughts about Lost Highway and you wish to share them please leave them in the comments below. If you have any alternative interpretations of the movie I'd be very interesting, interested to know what they are and that's it. You can follow me on Facebook and Twitter at The Vlog Lady and I'll see you soon. Bye!